So here we are. We're going to look at finally honest to goodness band structure in, in real materials. And we'll look at silicon, germanium, and gallium arsenide. That's in the context, of course, of really trying to understand real materials and real devices. We had calculated a 1D uh, band structure previously, where we wanted to look at bands where electrons can transport through a structure uh, and assign an effective mass, so they almost moved freely. We defined a Brion zone in which uh, electrons are uh, states are completely described. We didn't have to describe it with an infinite amount of uh, crystal points, uh, a crystal, but we could collapse all of that property into a, uh, a Brion zone. The Brion zones were looking pretty complicated for a, a realistic material, so they're not perfect cubes, and we had identified specific crystal directions, and we identified constant energy surfaces like these here, uh, which are in a sense, on the circle here of a constant energy, and we identify density of states that give the differential number of states as a function of energy, like this. All right, so now we're going to do all of that for real materials and explain some aspects of these real materials and then how to make this look simple again so we can do simple calculations. All right. Uh, again, we have this rather complicated looking Brion zone for a diamond lattice. And we want to represent information according to certain crystal directions. And that is somewhat resemblant of having a set of information like a four-dimensional data set, which, where you have information like density or temperature or something in uh, a coordinate system of x, y, and z, or as a function of uh, theta, phi, and radius. And you've seen in other fields of science how you would plot such information and get information out of such a system that it would be hard to render unless you have very sophisticated um, imagery. And then it's really hard to get quantified information because color coding things may not be very helpful all the time. So this is actually an art to make the right data representations. So in crystals and semiconductor devices, we utilize these Brion zones to cut formation in certain crystal directions. So we're going to do this here for germanium. And we're going to look first in the direction gamma to L, as indicated here by this line. And we're going to look at uh, the EK diagram of germanium in that crystal direction. So. So here is the EK line indicated in blue for, uh, for germanium. And what's interesting here that the minimum point here is at L versus at gamma is the normal origin. So the minimum point of energy in the conduction band for germanium is not at gamma, but it, it's at L. Now, there's some other bands, if you look that you start uh, compute or uh, visualize or uh, understand, starting from the gamma point, there is a line here shown in red dashes that longs around the red line here. And you see it goes way up in energy and comes down at the X point. There's another band that comes from very high energy from gamma down towards the X point and then bends back up. All of these energies are above the minimal point at L. So these are states that are above the minimum conduction band edge in, uh, at the L point in germanium. And so therefore, we mostly consider energies here. And I'm drawing this on purpose like a parabola here at the L point. And we'll talk more about dispersions there. All right. So for silicon, the, the matter is slightly different. For silicon, the minimum point is actually along this delta line. It's not exactly at x, but it's a little bit inside of x, 15% of the uh, Brion zone. And um, the dispersion is way high at, at gamma. And if you go into the L direction, it's also way high. So the really critical um, 
energy really and dispersion for germanium is here at the X, uh, towards the X point inside the Brion zone. Now, um, gallium arsenide is in that sense very beautiful. It has its minimum point at, at gamma. So all of the critical information happens here at gamma. And we'll talk more about gallium arsenide and its very simple band structure in a few minutes. All right. So the message here is that the minima may not be at the zone center, at the highest symmetry point. And germanium has eight of these kind of valleys here. And silicon has six. And um, gallium arsenide is symmetric. It has everything that's of most relevance here at the gamma point. And we'll go into more detail in the two slides down. Now, if we look at the valence bands, and you squint a little bit, those three materials look roughly the same and the same complicated. Um, we'll find methodologies to simplify these bands and how we usually mostly use them. But there's really three bands you need to keep in mind. There's something called a light hole, a heavy hole, and a split off band. And they all have their um, top highest value here at the gamma point. That's the top of the, uh, the valence band. All right. Now, let's look at gallium arsenide in a little bit more detail. This is gallium arsenide band structure at room temperature. Its gap is 1.42 eV. Its minimum conduction band edge is, as I mentioned here, gamma. The three valence bands of relevance are here. They are topping out at the gamma point as well. The split-off band here for the um, uh, valence band here is 0.34 eV away from the top of the valence band. Now if I look at here the energy on the top of the conduction band and I look up from 1.42 to 1.90 that is roughly 0.5 eV. Now let's relate those uh, energy distances to something physical. Well, you will see that energy excitation and energy uh, carrier distribution depends on the uh, um, Boltzmann constant and the temperature in Kelvin. And at room temperature, that energy is 0.25 EV, 20, well, 25 millectron volt. Okay? So, if I now consider an energy distance in a band structure as a uh, multiple of thermal energy units. So, if I take this 0.5 eV, I have 20 kT of energy distance in there. If I consider a Boltzmann distribution of carriers of e to the minus delta e over kT, and we'll go more over that in, in the later part of the course, I get e to the minus 20. So e to the minus 20 is an insanely small number. That would be the occupation of states way up here in energy. So these bands exist, or the split-off band exists in terms of number of holes. The typical occupancy of holes and electrons, those energies far apart, is typically negligible. So we typically focus in gallium arsenide here on the conduction band uh, on, as a single band, and we typically focus on light hole and heavy hole bands here as well. So that explains a little bit of the approximations that you will see later in this course. Now, let's look at some uh, less perfect materials. Consider, for example, he not so perfect, uh, the uh, comparison, the perfect silicon, com consider the not so perfect polysilicon out here. And let's look at polysilicon like this. We've discussed in the previous section uh, the emergence of band structure as a number of atoms as they emerge. And we've seen that the, the band gap narrows and becomes very well defined as long range order. Uh, came into being. But even if you had smaller crystals with fewer atoms, you saw band pass filter-like behavior. That means, and the flip side here, 
that you might have band gaps that are slightly different for all these crystals that are sort of butted together. And you could think of uh, plotting a material property like this, where you take a cut through this device, and as you hit an interface of a poly, uh, in the polysilicon uh, uh, material, you might have a slightly band gap. But there will be a band gap. You will have more scattering because you have these imperfect interfaces, uh, but there is something like a band gap. So you can have conduction through a structure like this with band gap. So the point of showing this is also that you don't necessarily have to have complete periodicity. So periodicity in a semiconductor is sufficient to get you a band gap, but is it is uh, not necessary. So here are some other examples of, of amorphous materials that show a full band gap. And early on in the course, I mentioned ge silicon germanium, which is a, is a compound. And I had shown a picture where the, uh, you, you saw a random alloy. And we know that the silicon germanium as a material is a random alloy. It doesn't have perfect long range order but we know it has a band gap, it has an effective mass, etc. And the question is, how large of a system do you make to have an average band gap, etc. So, so these are interesting theoretical questions, for, but from a practical point of view, we know that there's amorphous system that, uh, that do have um, uh, band gaps. Okay. All right, so we now have shown here in Section 10.1, EK diagrams of honest-to-goodness materials and uh, indicated some uh, methods of how we might approximate these materials. And now we're going to look at constant energy surfaces that are similar to this, where we are going to slice through EK diagrams at a constant energy and then plot them, say, here in, in a space like this. Okay, so that's going to be in the next section.